Welcome to the Big Heart Business Show. My name is Carrie Shepard, business strategist, philanthropist, and believer. I'm on a mission to help entrepreneurs be more, do more, and give more beyond their business, and to do it with more heart and less hustle. Each week on the show, I'll be here with a message or interview from a powerhouse entrepreneur that has built their business by giving back. Together, we will inspire you, fuel you, and get you going with simple action steps and strategies to grow your purpose-driven business. Our philosophy here is that we can change the world one big heart business at a time. Let's get started. This is episode number two of the Big Heart Business Show. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Kristen Lawrence. Kristen is a peacemaker and teacher of all things about conflict resolution and peacemaking from a biblical perspective. She is a sucker for a good overcoming story and loves watching animals play. When she's not coaching or learning, you can find her playing games with her family on a yoga mat or talking stupid to her dog. Kristen practices everything she teaches with her family and her community around her. She's been married for almost 22 years and has and has three children, ages 20, 19, and 15. She has a master's degree of um, she has a master's degree of resolution from SMU and worked in the courts as a mediator and a rest, restorative justice coordinator for the juvenile division program. Since moving to California five years ago, she has been focused on offering group workshops and biblical peacemaking, as well as coaching private clients who seek to resolve a conflict or learn how to get along with coworkers family members, or who simply want to have a better relationship with God. Welcome, Kristen. Hi, Carrie. I'm so excited to have you on the show, and I just love the work that you do and the heart that you have to serve your community. So I would love it if you could just share with our audience a little bit more about how you got connected with the work that you're doing right now. Oh, for sure. And it's kind of it's kind of a long journey, I think. Um, so. I was always just a house uh, stay-at-home mom, and um, we got married very young, and all I wanted to do was stay home, so I stayed home for 11 years, and um, my husband decided that he wanted to go back to school, which meant I needed to go to work, <laughs> so I went back to school um, to study um, paralegal, um, how to be a paralegal, and during that course study, I found... Um, a class that was called Alternative Dispute Resolution, and it rocked my world. I loved every minute of it. I couldn't get enough of it, and before it was over, I had already signed up to take a full master's load of um, studying peace, peacemaking and conflict resolution, and, um, and I just can't stop studying it since. <laughs> but it changed a little bit since I moved because I didn't want to support the courts anymore. I didn't want to just go by what they wanted to have me do for them in mediation because really it was just about dividing assets or parenting plans and um, helping people make those decisions, which was great. But then I had to send them home still with the burdens on their hearts of the relationship and because I didn't have enough time to really address that matter. So I changed the focus of my practice to um, really look at relationships and look at the heart of um, how come people aren't getting along or, you know, those sorts of things. So while we, while I look at how to resolve substantive issues like money or time management or whatever, um, I also can address now uh, the heart. Mm, That's a beautiful journey. And really to see, I think that's, really apparent when you see a need in the marketplace and you have that passion for it. So it really seems like not only did you find something that you really loved, but you really saw where you could really, um, really serve people. Yeah. So obviously we all can have conflicts in our life and in, in relationships. And even as you talk about, you know, just living, I would love it if you could share with our audience, are there some tips that you could give that you practice in your work? As far as, 
which, which kind of tips are you looking for? <laughs> yeah. What, you know, just if people are looking at how do they, how do they resolve conflict peacefully, you know, whether it's with a loved one or a coworker or in their business, what would be some tips that you could give them to, to help resolve conflict? Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with just knowing, um, what our needs are because like the Bible says, um, and I do all my, all my conflict resolution, um, basically comes from a biblical perspective. Um, so I, I have to interject that because that's where, <laughs> where I'm coming from. Um, but the Bible tells us that conflict comes from um, the desires that are in our heart. And so when we have a desire and, um, and that desire is not met or someone kind of puts a little roadblock in there that we can't get to our desire, you know, can't find resolution to it, um, then we start to have conflict with that person. And, um, so it's just good for us to know our heart and what our needs are, what our wants are, and then also know what the other person's heart's saying too. You know, they have needs and they have desires as well. So, um, it's, it's sort of like an, an emotional intelligence, uh, level, you know, where you have to become aware of yourself and you have to become aware of what the other person's, uh, thinking or saying and needing. And then, um, and then really going from there, you know, seeing what's worth pursuing in that, in that conversation or in that uh, situation. Mm, that's so smart. Yeah. Having that awareness, I think is, is so key and, and it seems so simple, but can be so challenging. And it's I wonder, challenging. yeah. And I wonder if that's connected to what you brought up just now with emotional intelligence. Can you speak about emotional intelligence and kind of what that means? Maybe define it for our audience and maybe even speak about how we can increase our emotional intelligence. Sure. So emotional intelligence is basically um, being aware, being aware of, um, of what you're doing and saying and how that affects other people. And then, so then you're becoming aware of the, um, how other people are thinking and feeling in relation to what you're saying and doing. And, and when, you're, when you start to think about the other person more, then you start to empathize with them and you start to have... Uh, you know, an ability to relate to them in a different way than, than just focused on you and what you want. Um, so, so it's all about awareness. And in the faith perspective, you know, we want to be uh, God aware. We want to be self aware and we want to be other aware. So, so I really focus on those sorts of, of things with my clients so that they can, um, really begin to get a full perspective of how to live life with others. And it's a practice. It's not just a once and done kind of learning. It's, it's everyday practicing. And my husband and I, we do um, group workshops. We've done that for about three years now. And mm -hmm. we can tell when we don't run a group workshop, we can tell because our life, we're like, we forget. Mm, <laughs> we forget to how to relate to each other. And we're just like, I think we need to run a workshop because we're forgetting our principles. <laughs> uh, that's a good reminder that we always have to go back to kind of the foundation and the basics. So what are some things that you do on a daily basis that help you um, with conflict res resolution and really increasing that emotional intelligence for yourself? Mm, that's a good question too, Carrie. Um, well, first, I, I really focus on my walk with God. And I take time to listen to him and read the Bible and know what the Bible says. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to um, implement these things. And, um, and then, I don't know. I just practice every day. I just try to slow down. That's like the main mm. thing. I really try to slow down because if I'm too quick to talk with my family or too quick to jump into something that I'm uncomfortable with, then it just, it doesn't go well. It doesn't go well. So taking time to really listen and to really um, try to understand what's going on around me mm -hmm. is, is really the key because then I can hear better. I can, I can slow down and not say things that are going to hurt others. Wow. That's a great reminder for all of us. I think in just everything that we do slowing down a little bit. And, and I think it's that kind of the, the whole thing of like reacting rather than responding, you know, yeah. that, um, that can be a great reminder for us. So absolutely. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. 
So kind of going back to, you know, you're really going through that process of finding your passion. Oh, look who we have, a little friend. My, my stupid Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, so okay. Cute. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. We love dogs here. Um, so just kind of on the path to finding your passion and really creating that as your, you know, your mission field and, and really being able to monetize that. I think a lot of people struggle with that because they may have one piece of it. You know, they may have found their passion, but they don't know how to monetize it or they're in a business that they're making really great money, but they're not really passionate about it. I just wonder if you could share any kind of tips or, you know, through your journey, journey of finding both a, a way to really live your passion and create a business out of it. What would you tell somebody that was maybe going through that journey right now? I would say really stick with it. I, I, I think, I think you're, you're, you have it right there that it's no fun to make money or to, to, you know, go, go to a place where you're making money that it's not really your passion, you know, and some of us can do that really well. And, and I think that's amazing. Um, but I think for me and maybe others who are listening, um, what, what I love to do, I love to make money just doing what I love and that's listening to people and seeing the light bulb turn on, you know, of I I've been struggling with this one thing or this one relationship for so long and um, the things that you're asking me are starting to make sense, you know, and, and I think, you know, one, one thing that's kind of funny, especially in the dispute resolution world and the conflict coaching world is that many of us would do this for free. <laughs> and, and many of us do, um, we're not clinical, like psychologists are clinical or, or social workers are clinical and they right. have to work um, to get their, their, their certifications. They have to work. Uh, for free for maybe like 3000 hours or more sometimes in order to get their, um, their clinical status. And, and many of us in the conflict resolution world, we do work for free in the very early years because we, um, we, there, there just isn't a place where we can make a lot of money doing this. You know, the, if you work in the court systems, there's no money there. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we get, we get, we get money, but it's not a very much um, to make a living off of. So many of us, we do start out um, volunteering on different boards or just offering our services to the courts or the city around us um, for free. So, so it does become a passion of ours. And then making that transition into making money is a little difficult, you know, it's because while we, we need to make money, it's not something like we would just rather just do our work. Cause it is, it is, does become our passion. Yeah. That's oh, so many great, so many great ahas there for me, because I think you're exactly right. If you're not doing something that you're willing to do for free, then I think that's a real, um, a real temperature gauge that we're not doing what we're really most passionate about. Yeah. And like the same thing is, is it's something that becomes so natural that, you know, yes, there's going to be studying. Yes. There's going to be practice that we need to do, but it's really, to me, again, it's the heart of, of who you are. Yeah. So I think you bring up a really great point as we're kind of, um, you know, I'd love to kind of talk about your give back plan in your business. And, you know, that's one of the core beliefs that I have. And then also that I'm really wanting to highlight on this show is that how entrepreneurs are making that impact and that difference in the world. And, and you've touched on a little bit of it already by, you know, giving your services away for free. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what that looks like, but I also would like to dive into the charity that you have chosen to partner with and the work that you do with them. So I'll let you speak on both of those. Yeah. So the charity that I work, um, been working with now, uh, is called Lemonade International. And very interesting story how I got connected with them. For, for years, I have been looking for a nonprofit to work with. And um, I actually thought for, for a little while, I thought, I'm going to have to make my own nonprofit because there is nothing out there that is, is allowing me to do what I love, which is, you know, peacemaking and conflict resolution, teaching in the communities or um, restorative practices. And so, so I thought I was going to have to make my own organization so I could actually do this, but I'm, I'm not exactly wired that way. And I thought it would be too much to run a whole organization. So I kind of just waited around a little while and I kept knocking on doors 
But my one friend, she started a shoe company. And I met her back in the, on the East Coast where I used to live. And um, this shoe company, she actually partnered with somebody um, in, in this, um, from Lemonade International. And um, it's, it's called um, the, sorry, I'm getting all mixed up here. The, um, the city that they serve is called Lali Manada, which means the lemonade. And it's, it's so interesting oh. because you think, oh, lemonade, it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful. And because it's refreshing, right? But actually the lemonade in Guatemala is a ravine and it is, um, it's full of all these metal shanties and cinder blocks for homes. And um, it's actually the dirtiest place in Guatemala. And it's so sad because when I, um, when I met these people, they said that the, uh, the, the biggest city next to them is Guatemala City. And the people in Guatemala City say that Santa Claus doesn't even go to Lali Manada. Because oh my it's so gosh. dirty. That's I know. heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. Oh. So, so this gal, she started a shoe company and she partnered with an artesian from Lali Manada. And I kept watching her story grow and I just kept watching her grow this company from the ground up. And she had no idea what she was doing, but she was making these shoes and she was trying to sell them here in the United States and make it happen. And then she started talking about Lali Manada and the gang activity and the drugs and just how hard it is for someone to live there and to grow up there. And it started to really click with me like, oh, this is kind of like right up my alley. So it's, it's how to resolve conflicts. Gang activity is so ripe with conflict. And, um, and the organization Lemonade International partners with um, Vitas Plenis, which means um, fulfilled lives. And that organization is run by Tita, who started in 1994, just walking around uh, Lali Manada with rice and beans. And she would just talk to the people and she would give them rice and beans and she would share the gospel with them. And so then Lemonade International came along, or well, it was born because they, um, Lemonade International was born because Tita needed more help. She needed like an infusion of money so mm -hmm. she could grow because mm -hmm. she, she um, plants schools so that the kids can have a meal, they can have better education, and they can learn um, health and nutrition, and they can learn about the gospel. So, so they came alongside of Tita um, to support her in her work. And now, um, this spring, they're going to launch their fourth school. Wow, that's amazing. And, and it's, very, it's actually a really small area to have four schools, but they need to have four schools because there's gang lines within the territory. And it's not very safe for kiddos to uh, walk across gang lines. So they serve each, each area with, um, with a different school so that they can keep people safe. Wow. Wow, that is an amazing story about how something gets born and yeah. how these women came together to really create such a big impact. So I'd love for you to kind of share with the audience about, you know, you kind of alluded to that you're going in there and talking to conflict resolution with the gangs. Can mm -hmm. you talk with us a little bit about, because I know you've gone over there several times and maybe share a bit of, of that journey mm -hmm. with us? Yeah, so um, because I knew my friend um, with the shoe company, she connected me with the president of Lemonade International, who just happened to be um, someone from my hometown in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh, what a small world. <laughs> a very small world. And, and he knew my pastor from um, my childhood church. So we started talking and I just told him what I do. And I said, I would really love to come down and see what I, could, what I can offer to um, Lali Manata. And so I went down just for a short visit and met with the teachers. And of course they just, you know, dug their way into my heart and I couldn't get them out. And the work that they do is so important. And, and it's just, it made all the connections real. You know, the thing that I was looking for, for all those years, how to partner with somebody, it all came together in that one visit. And then I went back again for um, a week long visit. And that time I, 
the school was actually closed because they had summer break and I spent an entire week with the teachers. So I get to teach the teachers how to use restorative practices and conflict resolution and um, they get to pass it on to their students. So um, that was just the first step. So I'm going to go back again at the end of May and I'm going to um, teach them some more um, peacemaking tools and they're going to be in session. So, so I'll get to see them in action with their students and hopefully we'll get to go out on the streets and work with some of the gang members and everything like that. So that, that I'm so excited about because not only will I get to connect with the teachers, but I'll also get to go out into the community and hear their stories and hear where they're at and mm -hmm. hear their needs, you know, because mm -hmm. it can't just be a once and done thing. Like I said earlier, peacemaking and, and resolving relationships isn't just a once and done thing. So it's yeah. a continuous uh, going there and, and learning their needs and speaking into them. And, um, and I, I think it'll just be a lifelong relationship that I have with them. Yeah, that sounds like it. And I love that the work is not just giving them, you know, it's kind of like just not putting a Band-Aid on it, but you're really going in there and, and kind of what we talked about at the beginning of this conversation is like, you know, having that awareness and understanding, you know, where they're coming from, because it is, it's a, you know, it's a third world country. It's not the same as gangs here in the United States or, you know, poverty here in the United States. And so I, I think that's so awesome that you're really taking the time to understand and then you're you're able to use your gifts to make that big, that big impact and difference. It's, that's just beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah. It makes all the study and all the hard work and trying to, you know, keep business flowing here worth it, mm. you know, because then I can use that money that I make in my business and I can go down and I can uh, um, give them all the tools that I have, you know, mm. and not have to worry too much about raising support although it's good to raise support because then you invite others in to, to be involved with what you're doing. Um, but at this point, it's just me that going down so far. Um, I would love to train some others so that we can go down as a team and, and be able to give this information um, in more depth. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, it's just me. So I don't have to worry too much about um, fundraising at the moment. That's good. So you do have a vision of bringing, you know, creating a team atmosphere to go down there and do this work. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And do you ever worry about your safety when you're down there? Because obviously you're saying there's, you know, gangs and having to have these schools for the division. Do you ever worry about um, yourself? I don't know. They're pretty safe. Um, I always have a guide with me and I always have so we can drive in with that guide because they know they know the people around um, Lolly Minata. And then um, we always have one of the teachers come and meet us at the car. Mm -hmm. And then the, that teacher will um, take us to the schools. That's awesome. Um, so there are protocols and there's, there's certainly safety measures. We normally have to leave around 4.30 in the afternoon. And because that's when people start coming out, you know, for the evening activities or doing mm -hmm. whatever they do at night. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we did drive through a couple times in the evening and it really was a different atmosphere. It was, they, they all came alive. They all came out of their houses and they basically, you know, hang out on the streets um, mm. until very really late at night. So, um, so it's not a good place to be at night and especially not looking like them. Um, sure. I always have to be with somebody, but I always feel safe. And awesome. I've, I got to visit um, Otto, who is the shoemaker and um, go into his workshop and see all the guys that he works with. And his program is, is very neat because he used to be a gang member and mm. um, he was on a, on a bus once that they would like often go on buses and they would take everybody's money at gunpoint. And um, one little girl that he, he came up to a mom and wanted her money and a little girl took all her money out of her pocket and, he, and she said, here, take this money because um, I, I don't want you to hurt me or my mom. Just don't hurt my mom. And because they would kill people if they didn't give them money. Mm. And, um, he said, he said at that moment, his heart broke and he went back home to Lali Manata and he asked, there's churches there, of course. And he went and asked the pastor, he's like, 
I can't do this anymore. Can you help me get out? So he got out of the gang life and he started making shoes. And now he takes gang men, members who want to get out of gang life mm. and he gives them a job so that they can earn real money and not have to go and, and hold people up at gunpoint, you know, or steal or um, sell drugs. Mm -hmm. So, so his program, you know, he, without the work with, he does other work too in Guatemala, but without the work with um, Bethany and the shoe company here in America, um, you know, he wouldn't be able to do a lot of what he does. He, he supports Lali Manada, um, the, the Vetus Planets. He, he supports their school feeding program. Oh, wow. So that's awesome. For, for the last few years, for three schools, he helps to support their feeding program. And, and that's his gift back, you know, to the community. So he's an entrepreneur that is giving yeah. back. And he really doesn't make a lot of money. Yeah. You know, considering us like you know a lot of our people maybe people who are listening to this or people who are in america we think oh we can't really get involved and we can't give because it, it costs a lot of money to eat or it costs a lot of money to live but that's an american mindset yes right it costs so much for us to eat and so so much for us to live here in america but it doesn't really cost a lot there you know ten dollars a month can help one kid eat for two weeks in one of the schools. So if we just give $10, that's nothing to us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so nothing. I can spend that in a lunch here oh, in America. Easily, you know? easily. So if our audience wants to get involved or wants to look at giving back to this organization, where, where would be the place that they could uh, connect with? Lemonade? Yeah, they want to go to lemonadeinternational.org. Okay. And okay. there's a, um, a get involved button that they okay. can press and they can actually sponsor teachers. That's, that's the more expensive part. They can okay. give a one-time gift, you know, okay. and, and it'll go to, um, medical or food or shoe program. Um, or they can, if they feel like they can, they can, so, uh, sponsor a teacher and they can partner with another person and, and split the cost of that, or they can sponsor a scholar. So after the children go through, uh, say, middle school, they have the choice then to either stop school or go on mm -hmm. into high school. But it costs a lot of money for them to go to high school. Um, and then that, that gives, if they can go to high school, that gives them a way that they can, um, you know, have a chance to get out and do something else besides just live in the shanties. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's a little more expensive. That's $100 a month that they okay. ask. Um, and you can split that. You can just do $50 a month. But so those are the two big ways you can sponsor a teacher to work or you can sponsor a scholar to go awesome. to school. Okay. Yeah. And we'll definitely make sure and leave that link in the show notes as well. So, um, but I think that's, thank you so much for sharing that story and that journey. And, you know, one of the things that I hear quite often is people saying, well, I'll give back when I start making a certain amount of money or, you know, when I get to a certain level, what would you tell an entrepreneur that might be thinking that, you know, they, they may think, oh, this organization sounds really great, but you know, I'm not making enough money right now. So I'll have to wait to give back. Mm -hmm. You know, mother Teresa, is it mother Teresa or is it, oh, no, it's not mother Teresa. It's, um, I can't remember her name now, but she says, um, no one gets poor by giving. Mm. And that is so true. You, you will never be done with your money here. And any little bit that you can give or any little bit of time, if you don't have money, give your time. You know, I think that's sometimes in America, that's even a harder commodity to give is giving your time. So true. And even if you just call the organization that you think you might want to work with, you know, ask them, what is something that I can give you in my time that um, doesn't really cost me any money at the moment um, that would support you? Mm -hmm. So give your time if you don't have money. And if you feel like, what's, what's $10 going to do? Call the organization and ask them, what, what can my $10 give? Because everybody has $10. Everybody has $5, mm -hmm. you know? And of course, in America, our, our, our common thing is give up your latte, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's $5 for a latte and, mm -hmm. you know, for 15 minutes of enjoyment, but it, that, 
that can give you know so much to another organization so so i would say there's never a good time you know to wait you just can't you just yeah. have to go go for it and if it's something that's really passionate in your heart to support somebody um support any organization and the efforts that they are giving to um you know right the wrongs that are in the world there's you don't need to wait yeah oh that's so good and i love that you're really because I do hear, you know, I think that too sometimes, like, what's, what, what's $5 going to do? What's $10 going to do? I want to wait till I can give hundreds or thousands of dollars. But that's such a good reminder that every dollar really does make a difference. And it's not the same as what a dollar can do here. So thank you for that. And then, of course, giving back our time. That's, that's so, so vital. Um, so I'd love to, we're going to move into the lightning round. I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions. And then um, we'll get wrapped up here. So First question is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Ooh, this is good. So the only bit of advice in our premarital counseling that we got that really saved a lot is um, don't tell your family anything bad about your spouse. Ooh, I because like they, they cannot forgive your spouse like you, we have to forgive because we have to live with them but your family it, it's harder for them to forgive That's so don't tell one. your spouse you know, don't tell your family anything bad about your spouse <laughs> i like it i like it okay number two what is your favorite quote or mantra that you live by oh um gosh that's a hard one carrie or maybe bible a bible <laughs> verse maybe that you kind of live by um well i my favorite book of the Bible is, um, is Philemon oh. because it talks about a person named Onesimus, which means useful. And everybody on the planet wants to be useful. And I just love the, the unfolding story in that it's only 27 verses. It's just one of the shortest books of the Bible, but it's the most impactful for me because I feel like a part of my work is wrapped up in helping people to feel use, useful and helping mm -hmm. them to um, want to give more into an, a relationship so they can get, you know, peace out of it. Mm, that's awesome. Okay, we'll definitely have to, to reference that as well in the show notes. Um, <laughs> so when you think about a book, um, what kind of book would you recommend to our audience and why? Uh, I love um, Kisses, Kisses from Katie. And um, she is so inspirational because I love inspirational books, first of all, besides learning books. I love inspirational books because mm -hmm. um, like the kisses from Katie, she just talks about her story about how she got started um, uh, doing missionary work in Uganda. And at 19, talk about passion. You know, 19 when she graduated high school, she went to Uganda and she was only gonna stay for a year. And before she knew it, she already adopted 11 girls. Holy moly. Wow. So she, she wasn't leaving Uganda anytime soon. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, so she just the, those kinds of stories of people who um, had a passion and they said yes to it. Awesome. I think that's a perfect recommendation. Awesome. Yeah. And then lastly, what's one thing that you do every day that helps you stay in action towards your, your mission? Mm, I love to stay in community. So I love to um, just hear what other people are doing. You know, it's, it help, it's so helpful if I hear somebody's story and I get to connect with somebody about where they're at in life because it makes me always go back and reflect where am I at mm -hmm. and what can I be doing to either continue where I'm at or to go a little bit further. Awesome. Staying in community. That's a great piece of advice and, and a step to take action. So, well, Kristen, I just want to thank you so much for being on the Big Heart Business Show and for sharing your journey of really finding your passion and your place in this world. And I love hearing about the work that you're doing with Lemonade International. And it's so important. And you're just such a blessing, not only to those around you, but to that country and to those people. So thank you for being that example of how we can really make a big difference in the world. So I just really want to thank you and let you know we really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it too. Yeah. This is such an exciting new thing for you too. And I'm, I'm just so excited to be on this journey. 
and be a part of it. Yeah, it's great. Well, how, um, how can our audience, um, find you where, where's the best, best place that they can locate you? Um, at kristenlawrence.com. Okay. And, um, yeah, just, there's a connect, um, tab there, connect with me and just fill out the form. Or you can look on Facebook, of course. I have a business page on Facebook, and I also have a private um, Facebook group called Community Life Labs. And there, um, it's just a small community growing, hopefully. And uh, we just connect about life and peace and how to, you know, have better relationships. Awesome. And again, we'll put all those links in the show notes so that everybody can easily find them. So again, thank you so much. And thank you for changing the world with your business and your life. So, oh, you're welcome. Yes, we'll catch everybody on the next show. Bye for now. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Big Heart Business Show. If you know someone that could benefit from this information, I would so appreciate it if you shared the love. And make sure to subscribe to this channel and leave a review. One last thing. If you're ready to fuel your Big Heart Business with a consistent flow of cash and clients, head on over to kerryshepherd.com forward slash free get to access a very special video series I created just for you. And don't forget, we are changing the world one big heart business at a time.